As it happens, I have a SHA-256 implementation because we code up 256 as part of my cryptography teaching. So we actually have a lab that does this. So I've taken a working copy of SHA-256 and I've edited it so that rather than just hashing from the start, I can also resume hashing at a certain point. Right. So what I'm essentially doing, if we look at my picture, is I'm saying rather than you give it a message and you hash all the way from to the beginning to the end, I say I want to come in here this is the current hash and the length of the existing message, off you go, right? And it, and it goes in from there. So I've got my SHA-256 implementation and it, it's, it's not particularly controversial, it's just a regular SHA-256 implementation in Java. But I've also added this continue digest function, which is essentially do a normal hash, but you're resuming from a certain point, which is the original hash and then however long that message was, because that's something that's not preserved in the hash function itself. If you were actually attacking, let's say, a bank transaction, you would usually know how long it was, because you'd have to know what the inner structure of the message was, otherwise there'd be no way you could attack it, right? But assuming that we can't do it because we don't know, never a good idea. So in my main function, I've just got this little test. I've got a pretend bank A, which is a class, and I've got a pretend bank B, and all I'm doing is I'm signing a bank transaction with A, and then I, or authenticating it, signing might be the wrong word, because it's not symmetric, asymmetric, and then I'm authenticating it with B. So in practice, what I'm doing is I'm taking my string, which represents my pretend bank transaction. I'm converting it into bytes, and then I'm calculating the hash of that transaction. And what bank A will actually do, bank A has a secret key that's in the bank code, which, which we don't need to look at. It's not important for an attacker to know what that key is, but there is a key. And so it's actually calculating a hash of the key and the bank transaction, right? And so the idea would be that me, I as an attacker can't recompute this because I don't have the key, but actually I don't need it, right? Because of this length extension attack. Then theoretically, this would get sent out over the internet. So this comment here just says, this gets sent over the internet, the bank B receives it and then has to verify this message. And so here B is verifying the transaction and one of two things will happen. Either it will raise an exception that says, your tag didn't match, your, your hash wasn't good, or it will successfully authenticate the transaction and then just for the sake of convenience, prints it out on the screen. So if I run this code like this, what we'll see is that B authentic authenticated the transaction of a thousand, let's say pounds, right, from here to here. Right? These are not real banks, by the way. And so, let, you know, if I change this message, so let's say I change, you know, message bytes and I change the fourth byte to a, a five, that's going to change the bank transaction, this should no longer be accepted because in, B, in bank B, it's checking the hash and the hash will have changed. Well, no, the hash should have changed, but the message changed, right? So if I press this, it should say authentication failed and it does, right? So that's, you know, so far so good. So you can test the use of mesh authentication code using a, using a structure like this. Um, the problem is that I haven't really thought this through, this implementation, which is a kind of trend for the sort of implementations that I show on the channel, right? You know, they're never really very good security-wise. Can you be honest with me? Have you been vibe coding? Right? <laughs> um, I actually turned the AI off because it was annoying me too much. It kept saying, do you want to write this? No, no, I want to write something different. Leave me alone. Um, so I've got no AI on here at all. I'm very pleased about this. Um, all right, so what we cannot do as an attacker is change the message and we cannot change the hash because if we do that, they won't match up and then the authentication will be failed. But we can extend the message and then derive what the hash should have been were that the original message, right? So that's what we're gonna do. So where this A sends a message to B, I'm gonna put in a couple of things that say, okay, attack here. This is our sort of um, pretend section of code between the two banks and this is the end of the attack. Right, and this is where we can add our code in to perform a length extension attack. Right. One thing to remember is that just before the hashing takes place, the SHA-2 algorithm will add padding. So we have to add that to our known message and so we can extend it, right? We, we can't ignore the padding because there will be some. So they'll have added padding to the message to make it a set length. Yeah, in fact, actually, maybe a good thing to do would be to draw out what the message should look like from start to finish, right? So. If I just put my laptop over here for a moment. So remember, what did bank A do, right? So let's, let's say A is in green, right? So A took the secret key, it took the bank transaction, so let's call this transaction. 
and then it calculated a SHA-256 hash, which will have added padding, right? And for, this, for now, we will ignore what it is, but I can tell you what it is. And so then this will go down to B and it will verify this transaction. What we're going to do, if I use red for my, you know, super evil attacking, right? I'm going to simulate this padding because I've received, I know what the, transa the original transaction was. Let's say you actually, you were A or B and you were transferring the money. Maybe I, maybe I invoice you, you, I know what you're going to then pay me and then I add an ought to the end of it, right? That's kind of the plan. Let's try that later, by the way. Um, so I'm going to simulate this padding. I'm going to create an attack that's key plus transactions. So I'm going to copy them down. I'm going to simulate the padding, which is only part of SHA-256. You wouldn't normally see it, right? And then I'm going to add my attack. So this is, going to, this is my attack transaction, which is going to change the amount of... The, the, you know, the transaction, then this is going to be hashed and I'm going to calculate the new hash based on all of this, right? So let's see that in the code. So the first thing we need to do is simulate this padding. We need to put the padding in as part of the message, otherwise we're not going to be able to compute the original hash. So let's say byte old padding is, I'm going to define it in hex because that's easier for me. So hex to bytes, I've got some helper functions to help me do this kind of uh, interaction. And what is the padding? Well, the padding for SHA-256 is a one, one bit of one, followed by all zeros, and then the length of the original message at the end. And I already have pre-computed that for us to save us some time. So I'm gonna paste it in. So it's eight, a bunch of zeros, and then in hex, three B eight, which is the length of the message. So we're gonna have our original bank transaction, followed by eight, zero, 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 three B eight in hex, Right? And then our attack, right? And then, so now we need to calculate our attack bytes. So let's say, okay, byte, attack, payload, and then let's say it's gonna be something like semicolon, because we know that oh, there's semicolon separating our thing. We're gonna copy this amount like this down here. So it's gonna be the same kind of syntax that we had in the original transaction, but I'm gonna add a couple of zeros, right? You know, why not? You know, get myself a bit more of a payday. And then I'm gonna convert this into bytes, right? Because all of my ha hashing is implemented in terms of bytes, just for the sake of my uh, simplicity. So get bytes, uh, standard char sets dot utf8. Okay, so I've got my old padding and my attack payload. And this is gonna tell me what I need to join together to create my length extension attack. So now we're gonna define what is our actual full new transaction. New transaction is, and it's gonna be concat bytes together. It's not very easy in Java to join lists together, so I'm just doing it, I've, made, I've written a function to do it. And we're gonna say, okay, we know the original message bytes because we know what the original transaction was. So message bytes with the old padding and the attack payload. So that is a representation of a new HMX hash. Right, that we're going to, going to compute. That's the message we're going to send to B to try and get it to authenticate. Right? We're going to be saying, this transaction you thought, it's going to be a bit longer than it was before. We need to calculate now the valid hash. And what we're going to do is take the hash from A, which is this transaction auth token, and we're going to continue it with the attack payload to move into where we, work, we are now. Right? And that should work nicely. That will make the new version of the message look authentic because it will have a matching hash, right? Yeah. So if you think that the original hash was you'd put the key in, you'd put the message in, yeah. and you'd put the padding in, now we're going to just put the attack bit in, and that's where we're going to end up, right? We're just going to continue from there. So byte uh, new token is... And then we're going to do SHA-256.continue digest. For reasons we can leave for another time, my SHA-256 implementation takes an input stream. So I'm going to convert this to a byte input stream. So new byte input stream. If any of you are thinking this is a lot of boilerplate code, welcome to Java. But I actually quite like it for my sins. Attack payload. So I'm going to put the attack payload in and resume. But I now need to tell this continue function what the original hash was so it can resume and what the length of the hash was at that time, so it can calculate the correct length of padding. Right. So it's transaction auth token, that's the original hash from A, and the length, which is 128, because it was two blocks. Right. Um, I happen to know that, because it was quite a short message, it got padded up to two block lengths, it's 128 bytes. All right, brilliant, so that should maybe work. This new transaction is the new bank transaction we're trying to sneak past B's guard, as it were, and this new token is the valid hash 
with the key that we don't have, continued from A's. Right? That's the idea. So now all we have to do is just overwrite the variable. So we're going to say the original message was called message bytes. So we're just going to say message bytes now equals new transaction. Right? And the token, which was transaction off token, is now equal new token. So we're just overwriting them. And you could imagine if this was over a network, what you would be doing is capturing the data coming in, stopping it, overwriting it and sending it on. Right? That's the idea. And so what should happen now, if indeed my code is as bad as I think it is, is provide a valid hash of this message with a secret key I don't have for this bank, which should accept this as a valid transaction, but for a hundred times more money than it was before. Let's see. It will show me in big. Ah, yeah, look, authentication succeeded, a hundred thousand pounds. Good, so we're in the money. Unfortunately, none of this is real. This is a really, really powerful attack. Right. The, all I've had to do is take A's transaction and the hash that A used to authenticate the transaction. I've extended the message and I've recomputed the hash, but I didn't crucially need the original key or any of that information from A, right, which is a big, big problem. We've kind of simplified it somewhat for this yes. kind of bank idea. We it's certainly not have. going to be that easy, but there must be places where this is a problem. It's, it's, a, it's, it's not a problem anymore only because we don't use message authentication codes quite as simple as this. We still use SHA-256 or SHA-2, or SHA but we use the HMAC now, or you know, Galois Max or digital signatures using uh, RSA or DSA rather than this way of performing a message authentication code, specifically because this is vulnerable to length extension attacks. I think it's a really interesting case study, though, in how something that looks superficially pretty good, right? You know, you, A and B, don't, they are the only ones that have the secret key, so I'm an attacker, I'm not going to be able to fake that transaction. Turns out I actually can, right? Now, we're working under the assumption that B is going to accept a transaction with a second amount for a different value on the end of it, but of course, who knows what their internal coding is like, you know? And maybe they didn't check because they just assumed no one would ever be stupid enough to do that, right? And if they did, the hash wouldn't be valid. But history is full of cryptographic systems like this where everyone's gone, this is brilliant, right? We're going to choose this. And then someone goes, oh, actually, there's this massive glaring problem that you haven't spotted. And now I can just multiply the amount of money you're paying me by a hundredfold and everyone's happy about it. And so the pigeonhole principle, and this applies to hash functions and draws, indirect let's draw principle, right? Depend, it doesn't matter how you define it. Once you have more items than there are places to put those items, you will have a collision. Right? Now, in this case of hash functions, we've got two to the power of...